very forward-thinking legal departments uh, with great insights to share on the usage of, of AI and how they're driving their strategy. And also Michael Deneen, who leads our data science team here at Bright Flag, uh, and I think is, is going to have some very interesting thoughts with everyone to share. And um, so as, as Colin mentioned, what are we going to be discussing today? There, there's ob obviously quite a bit of hype surrounding the use of artificial intelligence generally and specifically in the context of legal departments. And inevitably, that can lead to a degree of skepticism. But the reality is there are an awful lot of legal departments already using AI technologies, which are delivering tangible business results in day-to-day -day operations. So we're going to discuss the areas in which it's already creating value, discuss some of those use cases uh, that are in existence today and ones that are coming very quickly around the corner. So what specifically are we going to be discussing? First, we're going to agree on some basic definitions and features of what AI is and is not. Michael's going to set the scene there. Secondly, at a high level, we'll discuss where legal departments are, are already employing AI in their operations. And then we're going to spend a fair amount of time speaking with Alexander about how his team got interested in AI, what business problems they were looking to solve, and now that they've seen what's possible, what they see as next, coming next on the horizon. So, Michael, you've been working in data science for a long time. You've been focused on applying AI within the legal ecosystem for the last five years here at Bright Flag. For the benefit of our audience, many of whom I'm sure are relatively new to the concept of AI, can you firstly set the scene and explain what we mean when we say artificial intelligence? Hi, Alex. Um, thanks. Um, that, that's a really good question. Um, uh, so I think there are a few key terms that it, it, it's helpful to, to, to gloss to, to, to initiate the discussion. Um, I mean, typically when we talk about artificial intelligence, um, we're talking about software that learns to react to its environment and can generalize from these learnings to adapt to novel situations. Um, so if I've... Um, trained an AI or I've trained a machine learning model um, on um, invoices um, from legal service providers which are input into a system, uh, then I expect that it will be able to um, reproduce that training um, and generalize from that training to new cases in the future when I input new data into the system. The, the, the contrast here, Alex, um, I guess, is with a, a more functional traditional approach to software um, where software does you know, exactly what you tell it to do you know, it, it's a set of steps or many of items and it will do step A and step B and step C and step C. Um, you know, so I, I could think of, um, you know, navigating with a, a mouse across my screen and the mouse is going to um, to, to, to move as I manipulate the, the input device. Um, but, you know, the fact that I'm moving the mouse up towards the trash doesn't mean that the mouse is automatically going to move up towards the trash and put the file that I want to put into the trash in the trash. Um, because it's 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 just functionally reacting um, to the input that I'm giving it. Um, AI, by contrast, um, you know, reacts to its environment, um, and um, it typically moves to, to to predict from historical data um, to take an action uh, that that is is likely to occur again in the future. And um, so, uh, when, when I was in university, uh, a, a professor of mine, um, you know, used to often say that software is really only as smart as the People that make it, um, and I think that's it's still true, but it's kind of changed now. In that I think software is as smart as the data that you actually you, you train the software with. Um, I mean, I, I think an, another point that that's important to make here is you know it's it's really important I think to, to contrast AI um, as we implement it in legal operations today to um, you know a more general intelligence or or a hard AI, um, which is a replication of you know something like. Um, something like sentient, sentient intelligence. Um, I mean, obviously what we're talking about here and, you know, current state of the art of, of, of AI as it's implemented um, is much more narrow. You know, typically we train an AI to carry out a very, very specific function. Um, so even if we look at a case like self-driving cars, which is, um, you know, a really great application, a really advanced piece of technology, it's effectively it's it's just optimizing a particular function. You know, we 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 train the model uh, to get better and better and better at um, at answering a particular question that that, that we give it. Um, 
So I, I often think when, when we kind of talk about AI in, in these terms, you know, what we, what we really mean is machine learning. Um, and w w when I say machine learning, um, what I mean is software programs that teach computers to learn from data to carry out a defined task or a defined, you know, optimize a defined function. Um, so I might train um, a machine learning algorithm to classify um, legal billing narrative lines, um, or I might train a, a machine learning algorithm um, to um, classify the, the, the risk of a particular matter or to predict, you know, whether I'm going to whether I'm going to hit budget or whether, whether I'm going to overrun my budget. Um, so those are all you know really interesting applications, but they're they're very very narrow. Um, and I think that's that's kind of really important to um, I think to note. And, and and that's why personally, to be honest, I, I I actually feel that machine learning is a, a a better description of the current state of the art than AI. But I can understand why um, I can understand why why the term AI is is, is widely used. Um, so the the, the 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 kind of core thread, I guess, really um, is in you know moving from historic data to to generalization. Um, and and one other um, kind of term that I, that I think it's 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 useful to gloss is, is, is natural language processing. Um, so natural language processing um, is software that can parse and understand human language. Um, so the, the 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 contrast here is to um, you know more traditional um, approaches. You know really you're talking about before the the seventies and eighties even where people tried to develop um, you know extensive kind of rule based grammars. Um, to try to parse and understand language. And, you know, I, I think we often underestimate how difficult human language is to um, to, to understand, you know, and, 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 and since, you know, the, I suppose the rise of statistical approaches and linguistics and more recently with the rise of, of, of machine learning approaches, um, there have been, you know, really big strides in natural language processing and natural language understanding. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's, the, the, the difficulty, you know, can't be underestimated for a computer to, um, you know, to parse a very specific context that might seem very obvious to a human. Um, so, you know, you can even think of, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's a famous book by Lynn Truss called Eats, Shoots and Leaves. And um, that um, that book, the kind of the, the, the kind of cornerstone story in it kind of takes the sentence that a, a panda walks into the bar, eats, shoots and leaves. And depending on where the comma is placed, either the panda walked into the bar and had lunch and left, um, or the panda walked into the bar, shot up the bar and left. You know, so those are two really, really very different descriptions. You know, and as humans, we understand that context and we know that you know the panda, panda is an animal that eats, shoots, and leaves. But to teach uh, a computer to recognise that context, to understand that context, and to parse it um, is. Um, you know, is, 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 is a difficult thing to do. Um, but, um, you know, thankfully, there have been really big strides, you know, particularly in the last five to 10 years in, in natural language processing and natural language understanding. Thanks for sharing that that context, Michael, and, and kind of setting the scene, so to speak, is what we mean when, when we say AI and the distinction between machine learning, natural language processing. There is, I think, instances where things that are not AI or machine learning are being kind of put within that bucket and, and obviously there are, are uh, valid reasons why somebody may choose to implement a, a solution that that doesn't involve machine learning or, or artificial intelligence could you maybe talk to us about that distinction or those those things that are maybe getting bucketed under under the ai heading that, that don't really sit there um yeah uh, I, I mean I, I would say that you know inference and generalization is is probably the key to um, you know, classifying a system as an AI system or not, um, you know, is, is it learning from historical data and based on its learning from historical data, does it, does it change its inferences, you know, versus cases where, you know, you might exhaustively um, describe a set of rules where uh, particular terms maybe might be used to classify, um, let's say, legal, legal invoice narratives, um, you know, if, you, but, but the nature of, of, of language is it's, it's, it's a, it's a really long tail distribution. So there's always going to be another term that you actually haven't included in your specification, um, which means that, you know, that no matter how exhaustive your specification is, no matter how many rules or how many kind of logical clauses you, you include, um, you know, a rules-based system, you know, while appropriate in certain circumstances, um, isn't, um, you know, isn't best place 
for um for for natural language processing or natural language categorization or understanding. Thanks, Michael. And delving deeper into machine learning, people may have heard those terms, supervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning um, mentioned before. Can you help us to understand the distinction between the two and, and also where they're most useful or applicable? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, um, I mean, bro broadly speaking, there are two main branches of machine learning um, at, at, at a really high level. You, you have supervised learning and, and unsupervised learning. I would say that, you know, upwards of 95, 99% of practical applications um, in the marketplace are supervised learning applications. Um, so for a supervised machine learning model or supervised machine learning application, um, we take um, a, a supervising outcome variable that we want to train our model to predict or classify. And we take predictor variables that we believe are correlated with this particular outcome. Um, and then we train the model um, to infer from our predictor variables what the value of the outcome variable is going to be. Um, so we might be interested in, um, in litigation outcomes. So we could gather a data set um, which contains historical litigation outcomes and a description of those matters, you know, the type of proceedings, um, the judge, the industry, details relating to the, the, the plaintiff or defendant. Um, and then we would train the model um, to um, you know, basically model the relationship between the, the predictor variables um, and, and our supervisor variable so that when we feed new data through the model, um, the model makes a prediction that's very similar to what you would have seen in the historical data set. Um, so when we talk with kind of supervised learning, um, you know, we don't necessarily mean that there's a human in the loop for the machine learning training. Um, you know, whether there's a human in the loop or not for supervision largely depends on the, the data source itself, you know, so if I'm looking at something like historical litigation outcomes, I don't really need to add anything to that data set to, um, you know, to get a useful outcome. And uh, my, my predictor variable, um, you know, is, is, is part of the data set. Um, but if I want to, um, let's say, get a, a classification of predictor clauses in the contract, I actually need a data set if I'm building a supervised learning model that actually has a contract with terms highlighted and those terms classified. Um, and to train the model, I need a large volume of those contracts so that for future new use cases, the model can recognize uh, that this particular clause belongs to, to this particular book or this particular category. Um, and similarly, um, you know, the work we do in Bright Flag, we have um, a, a gold standard validated data set um, that we build on historic data uploaded to the system, which we use to, to supervise or to train the model so that when new data is passed through the system, um, the machine learning model is able to predict what would have been the case in the gold standard supervised um, training set. So that's, that's, that's supervised learning in a, in a, in a nutshell. Um, unsupervised learning um, you know, is probably a little bit less common in, in kind of in final end to end solutions, I would say. And um, so typically when you're building unsupervised learning models, you have a data set that describes a set of behaviors, but you don't have target variables that you want to predict. Um, so it, it's often a little bit more exploratory and the focus is more on, you know, identifying groups or identifying clusters which are similar in the data. Um, so for example, we might have um, a description of timekeepers billing practices um, and we could train an unsupervised learning algorithm to recognize what the typical groupings of timekeepers are. Um, or we might have um, a, a set of, um, of, of legal service providers and their, their billing history, and we could train an unsupervised algorithm to um, group those into, um, into, into meaningful groups. Um, so they're, they're really powerful techniques, um, but um, the distinction is that you, know, you, don't have, you don't have a target that you're training for you know, when, when you apply algorithms in an unsupervised fashion, you, you, you're really just interested in, in kind of in groupings and in similarities in the data. Um, I mean, it, it, it can sometimes be a preparatory step for supervised learning models. You know, if, if you need to gather a data set and parse a large volume of data quickly, it can be useful sometimes to apply some of these unsupervised clustering algorithms to, to, to group um, objects together and use it as a preparatory step to building a, a data set for a, a supervised learning model. Um, but um, 
like I said, it's 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 a a little bit less used in end-to-end -end applications. And and Michael, obviously, this is a legal operators webinar. It would be remiss of us not to kind of delve into and discuss where AI can specifically help our audience answer specific questions where where maybe other non um, non machine learning or AI solutions cannot. Can can you maybe elaborate on specific types of kind of business problems legal operations or legal departments face that that AI can can help them solve? Um, yeah, I, I mean. You know, fundamentally, Alex. I mean, I know we're 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 both on the same page on this. You know, I don't think there's any point in 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 delivering or developing a machine learning model unless it's doing something useful and answering you know a practical need that someone has. Um, so you know, we can think about you know supervised learning algorithms, and if we talk about classification, you know, so cases where we're uh, building a supervised model to identify a category. Um, you know, it, it, you, you could use it to identify, for example. How a particular person relates to a matter. So, you know, in in the bright flight context, we have um, a set of supervised models that we use to identify the role of people who occur in narrative lines. So we know this person is client, this person is um is, is outside counsel, and this person is intern to the law firm, and so on and so forth. So that can be really useful to to analyze communication patterns um in um in in bills. Um, you know, the the the, the core of of, of the Bright flag platform obviously is is identifying what type of legal work uh, a particular um, narrative line is, and so that's another example of um, a, a really practical application of a classification technique. Regression techniques then are you know they're supervised algorithms, but they're supervised to predict um, a continuous variable, so a real number, you know, a time amount or a dollar amount, so something like how much will we spend next month on this matter, or when are we going to hit the budget on this matter, would be kind of good examples of practical questions that you, you could answer with um, a regression model, which is an example of a supervised learning model. And then clustering techniques, like I said, are, are unsupervised models. They're, they're really, really useful. Um, so you might be interested in asking, is there something unusual about this invoice? You know, is it is it far from um, the typical um, the typical profile you'd expect or a typical member of a group um, or what are, what are a typical law firm portals? So uh, there are, you know, a lot of different questions that you can answer using that te those techniques. Um, but I think um, I think the questions are key. You know, the techniques are, are, are always secondary. And, and Michael, uh, as a data scientist, you obviously, you can't build models or understand the outcomes you're trying to achieve in a vacuum. Obviously, legal specialist knowledge plays an important role ensuring the usefulness and the practical application of the, the output that the technology delivers um, and I think that's really a really exciting development in in the kind of the broader legal ecosystem in terms of new career paths that's opening up for for legal professionals um, can you maybe elaborate on why you need that the the kind of human input within the supervised learning process and and specifically uh, where they fit um, in in the context uh, of legal spend management for instance um yeah, um, that, that, that's a good question, Alex. Um, I mean, it, it, effectively, it, it, it all comes back to to the data set. You know, um, if you're if you're if you're building a supervised model, the, the model is really only as good as the the data set that's backing it. Um, so th there's a really key role, um, you know, in in Bright Flag, and I would say in, in in all machine learning companies in annotating and validating and and curating um, a good gold standard data set. Um, so the the image on the screen kind of shows a typical supervised learning project or a typical supervised learning process, you know, and you, you start with a target data set. And in our case, um, it could be um, a, a bundle of invoices that have been annotated with task codes. Um, then you define your machine learning model. Um, so, you know, you define the relationship you expect to see between your predictor variables and your target variables. You initialize that more or less randomly. Um, you know, you can, there are lots of ways of initializing a model, but randomly is kind of as good as any sometimes. Um, then you evaluate how well the model does. That's comparing the model to your target data set. So again, you know, without a target data set, you can't even start to, to, to ask that question. Um, and after you've evaluated the model against the target data set, you tune the model to um, ensure that the model converges on 
the same type of answer that you expect to get within your target data set. Um, so there's, there's a process called gradient descent, basically, where the model will tune the weights to always reduce the error um, in the direction that looks like it's the biggest reduction of error. Um, so that's a long way of answering your question, Alex, but um, I hope it's kind of clear that if, if you don't have a good gold standard data set for this type of model, um, you know, you, 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 you really can't, you can't go very far. No, th th absolutely, Michael. I couldn't agree more. Well, Michael, thank you for that whistle-stop tour of uh, AI and machine learning concepts. Uh, hopefully that, that kind of sets the scene and gives people uh, a, a slightly greater degree of understanding of, of some of the key principles um, that we think about every day here at Bright Flag. Alexander, turning to you, I suppose, as somebody working within a very forward-thinking legal <laughs> department, how do you think about and talk about the value of AI within Ericsson and maybe what has helped your, your colleagues understand its, its function and value specifically within the legal team? Um, so Alex, uh, with us, it started in a way with the, um, the, 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 uh, the understanding that we were sitting on an enormous amount of, um, of data. I don't think this is specific for Ericsson. I think this will be the same everywhere. The, the, the journey of legal operations departments in, in, um, in large companies often start with, uh, actually starts with getting an e-billing system in place, uh, which then provides a, a type of transparency that you don't have um, uh, up until that point uh, because you, we're just getting PDFs. But it also, after a while, the, it starts to dawn typically on people that you're sitting on, uh, also on an enormous amount of unstructured data, um, primarily the narratives of the invoices where sort of, where, where sort of the, the juice um, is often in, in what you're trying to find out what, what firms are actually um, doing. Um, and what um what 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 we noticed is that um if you talk in in that context um about uh, what you're trying to achieve with ai and, and maybe even let the ai in that sense be a little bit in the background um and and and, and speak about that you would like to be able to understand what is sitting in in those narratives in the invoices um that people are are uh, quite uh, good at understanding what you're trying to do. And, and what we used to do to get the, um, the lawyers involved is try to explain that, or not try to explain, we explain basically that, um, that if you look at an invoice uh, on a matter, obviously you're looking one month, uh, one matter, one firm, right? And we explained that we would have data for all matters um, across all the times, uh, across all firms that we were using. And that, of course, for one person, it would never be possible to, to look at it that way. But if you have a machine that would actually highlight to you that something out of the ordinary was going on compared to all of the other matters that we're dealing with, then it became suddenly something that people would could could um, understand, basically saying, okay, I see what you're doing. We're basically uh, assisting the invoice review with all the data that we have rather than with my knowledge of what was done last month by that firm in that matter, which is of course an important analysis to do because you want to sort of see whether you got value for um, uh, value for bang for your buck basically, but it doesn't really tell you how it stacks up to what else is going on, obviously. No, absolutely, and 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 I think um, you've touched on something uh, really important there, Alex. In that, the nature of of legal work, there is very large data sets, not just in the kind of um, spend management space, but in in the legal ecosystem generally. Uh, legal departments, law firms, legal teams are dealing with large data sets. Um, and the opportunity to kind of derive much greater insight, drive much greater automation, uh, and ultimately become more efficient, make better decisions if they can if they can delve into that data in a more meaningful way. Michael, would you mind kind of uh, briefly elaborating on some of the other areas that you're seeing um, AI being used? Because certainly our our view or my view would be that this is the present; it isn't the future. There there are certainly other areas outside of spend and matter management and enterprise legal management where legal teams are already uh, deriving benefits from from AI. Um, hey Alex, yeah, um, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you. I, I I fundamentally do think that that these techniques are the present, and you know, they're, they're quite widely adopted. Um, I mean, you know, obviously in in 
in, in Bright Flag, um, we're using AI to you know classify and um, um, you know flag invoices for review. Um, Alex Alexander kind of you know made a, a really interesting kind of comment I think um, regarding you know uh, pre e billing um, invoice process with a, a, a lot of of manual review of PDFs. You know, and, and I think that one of the common threads across all of these applications of AI is that they you know they enable efficiencies of kind of scale and process you know by by allowing repetitive manual tasks um to be to be automated um so um outside of legal spend management um i think yeah they're they're, they're really um interesting applications in contract review um it's software that, that that does redlining of contracts um you know typically you would um configure um a playbook of of, of legal policies and then Software can do redlining for you. You can do compliance checks to ensure that the contracts are in compliance with your company policy. Um, you can use it for due diligence and acquisitions and analysis of clauses for risks. Um, again, you know, you have the benefit there in terms of time and efficiency, um, but also I think in terms of kind of accuracy and consistency. Um, in that you know all of these AI applications, you know, no matter what the volume of work on your desk, the AI is going to run. You know, um, so you you you, you get a a, a consistency of output from from a lot of these platforms. Um, litigation prediction is is another really interesting area. Um, so um, you know that there are um, software like Lex Machina that predicts litigation outcomes um, based on historical um, outcomes data. So you can have a data set with um, um, your court to judge a description of matter and uh, maybe a description of the other side and and use that then to um, inform tactical decisions and um, maybe about um, about settlement timing or settlement amounts. Um, I, I think there are also some interesting litigation financing companies who are using AI for litigation prediction to uh, to decide whether to um, whether to finance suits or not to finance particular suits. Um, E-discovery is you know quite an old application of AI. Um, I, I don't know the deep details of any of the systems, but I think it might be closer to unsupervised applications than a lot of the supervised applications you likely see under the hood in, in a lot of these other these other systems, and um, you know, again, it's 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 a really efficient set of tools for enabling the bulk review of documents. You know, if you have you know tens of millions or hundreds of millions of um, pages of documents that need to be um, reviewed and called to you know the hundreds of pages you might need for for, for court. Um, you know, e discovery tools are um, you know an application of AI. Um, I guess that allow you to to get get quicker you know get quicker deeper in terms of your your parsing of those documents. Um, and then, yeah, one other area that I think is, you know, it's it's kind of a an older kind of application, and, and, I, and I think a lot of the tools there. Um, the impression I get is that they, you know, they might be kind of business logic or rules focused. But um, you know, for contract lifecycle management, I think there are a lot seem to be a lot more AI solutions now for for CLM. So you know, doing contract data extraction from active contracts, and um, for AI powered assistance during um, during authoring to to recommend. Um, clauses based on historical clauses that were used maybe in the same geography or the same type of vendor, the same value of contract. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, there's, there's a few key themes there definitely across um, across all those applications. Um, you know, I, I think definitely, you know, time, money, efficiency savings are, are, are kind of really key. Um, and I think that that's where, where AI can be really useful. But, you know, I, I also think the fact that a lot of these tasks are, are repetitive tasks that, although they're adding value, you know, you want to free up human time to allow 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 human lawyers to do to do what lawyers do best, you know. And I think if if you take um, our use case in legal spend management, um, you know, I think applying AI to invoice review, um, it allows people to, you know, do a job that has to be done, but that's very hard to do in bulk and very hard to do consistently and um, in an automated fashion, um, which you know, in my opinion, is is, is a really good use case. Uh, and and Alex, I suppose from from Ericsson's perspective, have you considered or adopted AI in in any of the other areas that that Michael highlighted there? Or indeed, if you haven't, have you expectations of your law firms and external service providers um, around their usage of these tools to drive greater efficiency and how they deliver services to you? Yeah, so the, the latter, yes. The, the first, I, I'm, um, I'm not aware of any anything happening at the moment in, the, in these other areas there. 
there is a big push to do um, uh, to have a data strategy in place, uh, which then obviously one thing leads to the other. Uh, I assume um, in terms of what we ask of the of the firms, there uh, yes, much more that we would expect to see that um, that certain. Um, that certain types of machine learning and, and tools are being used to to our benefit, basically. So we were trying to um, understand and make transparent that these tools are being used, and then how they are being uh, used to the to the benefit of the client, basically, because that is not always immediately uh, um, clear. Um, mm -hmm. Not that it, I think it's always almost always clear that it has a benefit. It's just not always clear that things are being used and how they are being used. Um, and at least we are very interested to know because it could also be something that we could apply uh, and use ourselves in, uh, in maybe in a different way. But uh, if it doesn't help us really, it just happens only in the background. It's, it, it's always good if firms let us know what technologies they're using and what um, tools they're applying to the, to when, when providing the services. I, I couldn't agree more, Alex. I think if, if law firms and service providers are deriving those efficiencies, corporate legal departments should have visibility on that and understand how it's positively impacting both the cost implications, the service delivery as well. Maybe then kind of returning to Ericsson's AI goals as they relate to spend and matter management, could you maybe talk to us about what the business drivers were for Ericsson in, in, in implementing AI in this area uh, firstly? Yes. Yeah, so, um, as I as I mentioned at the beginning, we were realizing that we were sitting on a on on a, uh, on a on a pile of data um, that we were not really able to look at in a, in a clear way. But that in itself uh, could also have been the end of that. I guess you could just say, okay, well, that that's interesting, but we're, there's not much we can do with it. But um, the idea was to um, find out what was in there in order to. Um, uh, to to work out so the, the, the initial idea we had was to see if we could work out what the um, what the outliers are um, and that I, I guess it's a combination of the of the techniques that uh, Michael was describing before but it basically started with clustering so basically deciding what tasks belong together and what tasks are similar um, because of course if you want to know outliers you first need to know what the, what the norm is um, and this was an interesting part of the process uh, because it requires um, a lot of uh, in-house counsel or lawyer input it's very hard to um, I guess that's the learning part of the machine learning and um, it's it's impossible to say in theory um, whether or entirely in theory to say whether a task is to be um, performed at a certain timekeeper level. Um, so basically what we did is we um, did an initial clustering, which was based on, on, uh, on language recognition. So basically um, uh, clustering the, um, uh, the, the tasks in, 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 in groups that belong together according to the, uh, to, to the, to the, to the machine. Um, and then uh, it could, compare whether that task would be performed by a typically by let's say by a paralegal or by a um, uh, by a partner so it was a very in a way a very simple question we were uh, um, trying to answer because after a couple of years of sort of putting on the rates and setting up panels and so on you realize that the real sort of next lever is how efficient are the tasks being performed how far down is the task pushed in an organization, considering that the most expensive resource is um, is a multitude of, um, more expensive than the than the uh, the least expensive resource in a, in a, in the law firm model, uh, at least. So so it, we decided it would be key to work out whether a task was being performed at the right level, because most firms will typically tell you that they will push down the work to the right level, right, and they probably will also. Um, think so. We truly believe that they do that, but um, uh, but looking at the data, we we realized that that was not always um, the case. So um, so we started with that relatively simple concept, and it brought together uh, most of the elements that Michael was describing before. So on the one side, there was the clustering, uh, which can do for, for in the large part could be done automatically, but it also required some speech recognition, or not speech recognition, but uh, language, uh, natural language recognition, because. A single words of obviously in a certain order mean different things than um, uh, than 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 uh, the 
combined. The other thing is it's obviously something different than uh, if you write an email about a motion to dismiss or whether you draft a motion to dismiss, et cetera, et cetera. It all looks to a machine, it might all look to a motion to dismiss, but it's a different thing. Um, obviously, the task is different and could be performed at a different uh, level. So that was the that sort of the, the first um, the first approach to that, and then um, and then from there we sort of got um, a little bit more ambitious and excited, and, and 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 that's something that we haven't cracked yet, and we're working actually together also with with Michael to to see whether there is also um, because there's obviously this is also what the in-house councils told us there's also an element of um, uh, of sequence, right? There is the the junior, there's maybe the paralegal first, then the junior associate, then the senior associate, and then the partner looking maybe at the end quickly for the for the wrap up and making sure it goes, um, uh, it doesn't go out the door without being reviewed by a partner. Uh, so if that sequence is is correct, it might actually be fine that a partner spends twenty minutes on a motion um, to dismiss when uh, and and a junior associate uh, uh, works an hour and a half on it. That in itself doesn't mean that something is wrong with it. Uh, but of course, a, a machine that would say, okay, motions to dismiss always have to be done by a junior associate would flag that a partner also worked on it. So that's where it becomes more ambitious. And, and, uh, and Michael, I, I think you, you, you can talk to this better, but I think that's also where the learning comes in. So basically, mm. you basically teach the machine to understand the phasing of matters what matter is being worked on that a junior comes before senior um, uh, and and so on and then it becomes uh, uh yeah then it becomes very interesting i think yeah uh, that, uh, that's that's really interesting alexander and I, I was sort of just just thinking listen to you yeah i think that we're um we're, we're i suppose we're, we're kind of looking to Bring the norms to, to the level of, of of the phase in, in in this current pilot project or enrichment project we're working on with you. But you know, one of the things that that kind of rang a bell with me when you were talking is the idea of an appropriate level. You know, and I wonder is that anything that you would have you know considered modeling? Um, you know, not necessarily the appropriate level in sequence or the appropriate level by norm. You know, but it might be that okay, the norm is that partner spends X percent of time on this task, but for cases where they spent Y percent of time, there was actually a better outcome. Um, which is, you know, it's, it's a slightly different project and it's a slightly different question. But, you know, I think one of the powers of AI, you know, once you've collated your data set is that you can actually start looking at it through the lens of a predictor variable as well. You know, and you could say, okay, let's see if, you know, we're not just interested in outliers in terms of the, the distribution of, of the work and how the work was carried out, even by sequence, which is a really interesting question. But we want to see as well, what's the relationship between this sequence and a successful outcome? Um, you know, which which is um which which is another level deep. Yeah. Uh, and and Alex, I'd be interested in your perspective. Had had you tried to solve for any of these challenges? I know you've been working in this space for for quite a while. Have have you tried to to solve for any of these challenges in earlier in your career in earlier roles? And what type of kind of blockages or or, or issues to, did you find you encountered? Um, yes, we 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 did. Um, and 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 um, we we came quite far um, uh, but uh, it was easier on the on the basic level but already surprisingly insightful so um uh, one of the things that we in a, in a previous role where we where we developed these these um, capabilities we looked at uh, we worked together with a couple of sort of friendly firms to see what they would say if we would say okay um our model tells us this should have been done by a paralegal. Um, it, it, this was done by, by a senior partner. Um, we will not uh, uh, hold it against you because it's a past billing, but could you explain to us why? And then we sense checked um, several of the of the findings of the, of the model. And then we found a few interesting findings and, 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 um, and, and you could apply it right away. Um, and, and one of the things I think Alex was what you were, or Michael, you were probably uh, referring to that already a little bit is that the working assumption obviously is that partner time is more efficient right because they know more they should do the task faster that obviously gave us the idea okay then we should really check if it really then if the same task is indeed then done faster um, or not um, and um, th that was one of the things that you find out by basically talking to stakeholders um, uh, because the, of course the in-house councils told us a similar thing um, uh, but it was still 
interesting to hear it also from the from the firms directly. So it was um, it gave it gave a whole different perspective. Mm. But um, I we we did not fully solve for the for the for the sort of the I guess what Michael was referring to, which is more the uh, the more sophisticated part where you uh, where you can fully model the the phasing of a matter and 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 whether something was really done uh, more efficiently but um uh, but i i do think over time that should be possible as long as the data sets get gets uh, gets bigger and bigger you should be able to have uh, a repetition of the same type of matter in the same type of sequence and then again that will give you a data point if it was not done in that sequence or um or the, the sequence seems out of um out of whack um there was one thing i want to say maybe just um for this group because it might be interesting to understand that one thing that we did this was not at ericsson this was um in the previous role what we did is that we gave um the uh the the, the people that looked at the invoices um at the law firm invoices first a, uh, an actual tool that they could look at um, with like a, a bit of a gauge that would tell them whether a line item on the invoice was um, uh, according to the AI model was um, um, was likely to have an issue. So whether it was, whether it was likely to be done by a more junior, um, it should have been done by a more junior timekeeper or uh, in the other way around, it was likely to have been done by a too senior uh, timekeeper. And um, that was another interesting step because all of this in theory is, is already very interesting and, and, and we know it can be done, but the, the, the step into then, and, and I think that's where, where Brightflag also comes in the, because the, the Brightflag is the end tool. Um, the step then in making it into what is basically a, a usable product is, uh, is I think um, something you should almost think for, think about from the very start because otherwise it might not even make much sense to to build it to begin with right you you really have to think about how are we actually going to use it then at the end what are we going to do with this information um and that's why i'm also working with michael to to sort of see where that would end up in the tool and where we would see what um uh, come back uh after the modeling is done uh, and Alex, I think that that's such an important point. There is the kind of longer term strategic objectives around analyzing this data, developing norms around the appropriate resourcing on your, your for instance, large litigation work. What level should the discovery exercise be done at a specific motion, for instance? How long should it take? And using that data for future procurement, pricing negotiation, and management of matters actively going forward. But you can't, I suppose, lose sight of the here and now as well in terms of your matters that, that are ongoing right now and the experience of your in-house team and colleagues in easily managing those matters, ensuring charges are appropriate in line with guidelines, in line with budgets that have been set today. And what's what's your kind of experience so far of the kind of early wins in that space in, in, um, in using AI? Um. So I, I think it really, the early wins are probably that it assists the invoice review. Uh, that needs to be done anyway. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's something that Michael referred to earlier is that, that it's not really something you would want to, the, the learners to spend too much time on. So the more that is AI assisted, the, the less time they will spend on it. Um, the other element is, and which I, which is, is in a way already an early win, is what I mentioned at the very beginning, is that is the insights um, that it gives you across the across the board. So the, um, I think the fact that you can see across all the matters and all the um, all the firms um, and basically all your data, all your spent data, rather than uh, on a one by one case. Um, gives you um, gives you is, is almost immediately a win because it gives you insights that you don't normally have. Um, in my previous role, we also realized that so there was an, we made a, we made adjustments on the invoices. It was called something along the lines of not not appropriate timekeeper level or something like that. The fact that we could do that had also almost an immediate effect because. Um, firms started to realize that um, that we had certain insights 
that um, that may not have been available to 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 everyone basically. So that was uh, it's hard to quantify, but there there was a, a noticeable effect uh, that we started to say, listen, we we think this is a uh, this is not done at the appropriate level. Um, that there was an immediate effect of that uh, control as well. I think. And, and talking kind of longer term than Alex, you've obviously um, are, are heavily focused on using using the analysis and the, and the, the classification classified data to inform pricing, uh, resourcing insights around like large litigation matters, as we've discussed, for instance. Outside of that, would you you mind just sharing your thoughts about how you're going to manage? more generally your relationships with your law firms and service providers using the data and, and what other types of impacts you think it might have on your, your legal department strategy? Uh, various things. I think the, um, if, if the clustering is, is, is good enough, then it will also inform certain um, uh, insourcing decisions. Um, uh, if, you, if you break down uh, a, a matter into tasks. Basically, I, I know this is not unique, but if you if you can break it down in more detailed tasks, because you have the uh, the clustering that was done based on uh, on the narratives rather than on relying on, for instance, um, uh, uh, billing codes, then that could inform whether there might be areas where you could uh, do the work in house. That's definitely something. That and Ericsson is very focused on on the on the sort of zero waste and the, the right sourcing of I guess everyone is but but it's uh, it's very top of mind so to 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 get the the internal external um, balance just right uh, because that has sort of a double effect it it, it helps the announced councils doing really what they should be doing and also probably doing something they enjoy more doing um, and it also makes sure that you get the from the law firms, really, what you need from uh, from them, Ericsson has a quite a long-standing tradition of doing a lot of work in-house themselves. Which, obviously, from from my point of view as external counsel management, um, responsible is is a nice thing to have because it means that people uh, that their default setting is to try to do it themselves. But it does mean that also the legal department has taken on a lot of things where you could wonder whether it's the right place. Um, for them to do it. So our thinking uh, in the broader sense is beyond sort of invoice review and, 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 and looking for outliers uh, is also to see if we can use the, 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 collated deck, uh, the co collected data to, to see if we can come to a, um, yeah, to a different model of working uh, between external and internal. And then, of course, there's law firms and there's other service providers as well. Th those would come into the mix as well if we find out that a certain task is maybe not done uh, by the right resource. Mm, absolutely, and I think uh, that would certainly be a common thread I would see across our, our 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 corporate legal department clients that there is that journey that they're they're looking to go on, and and the philosophy underpinning it is ensuring the right resource is doing the right work uh, in the most efficient way, whether that's an internal resource, a, a traditional law firm, an alternative service provider, and obviously increasing increasingly potentially technology playing a role within that as well. Michael, would you be able to kind of share maybe some other examples of the kind of uh, the more forward thinking ways in which legal departments are looking to, to use the data, make decisions, become more efficient? Um, yeah, Alex, um, I, I mean, I, I would say one kind of really interesting kind of usage of data that um, we, we, we've recently enabled on the platform is um, around financial budgeting and forecasting. Um, so you know, we, we released um, uh, budgeting and forecasting module um, for last year, um, which when you create a financial budget, um, it will also actually create a forecast attached to that budget, um, which is you know a, a really powerful way of kind of allowing AI to assist with your management of your budgeting. Um, so you get an initial forecast based on your historical data, and then the forecast is constantly updated as um, new data is fed into the system. Um, so you can use it to predict, you know, am I likely to overrun this budget or, um, you know, uh, at what point do I actually expect to hit budget for this matter or this bucket of matter or this 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 department? Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's one kind of one use case, which I think is, um, you know, is relatively new. But um, I think I think really, really powerful. 
Yeah, and Alex, interested in, in your perspective on that. Obviously, it is uh, notoriously difficult for legal departments when they're asked by the CFO or the finance team to give a, a realistic prediction of what the budget will be for the year. There are many variables, M&A activity, litigation. Um, what, what's your experience in, in trying to facilitate a, a strong relationship with finance and the role you, you see data playing in, 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 in ultimately providing a more accurate forecast? Yeah, I, I think that that will be. I think it would just be very, very helpful. Um, in my in my previous role, we would run it basically the forecasting, uh, but it would basically just be Excel and then uh, the lawyers telling us uh, above a certain threshold what their matters are going to be um, uh, uh, costing in the next, in the rest of the year and then in the outlying years. Um, at Ericsson, uh, we 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 do that slightly differently. Um, and that's why this would be very interesting, uh, because it's, um, it's, it's ultimately, it's a finance, uh, process, right. In, in, at least in, in large organizations, you're really doing it because finance is, is asking you to do it. Uh, but, um, it turns out also to be a very strong tool for uh, demand management. Um, so the, but but of course it's not really something you would want your in-house counsel to spend too much time on. Um, so it's always a, a bit of a, a difficult thing to ask of people to do, even if they if they. I also realize that they tend typically struggle to to make the assessment, and and because so many things are changing. But even apart from that, even if they can, it's really just not so much the the core of what they should be doing. They should really be spending their time with Excel's and. And, and trying to work out how, how much per quarter um, each law firm is going to be charging them uh, for the matter in the next 12 months. Uh, but the data that you get from that and, and the, the outlook that you get from that is, is actually very rich for, uh, for demand management and for, for planning and for planning where the spend is going to happen and what firms you need to approach and so on. So whatever makes that easier even if it's not for the finance process but just for demand management uh would already be very helpful uh, i i think at ericsson that would be pretty seamless we could pretty seamlessly integrate that rather than having to set up a separate process that um uh that facilitates the the, the sort of the excel-based collection of forecasts Absolutely. And I think as, as legal departments and organizations scale and increase in complexity, it becomes harder and harder to have a kind of centralized picture uh, for legal leadership. And, and the classic example of an area, technology and AI can, can drive greater automation, drive greater visibility and, and make the lives of the in-house counsel team and, and, and the legal leadership as well as finance much easier and and, and in our experience, a key relationship is, is that relationship between legal operations and, and finance, um, which, which can be really mutually beneficial. I'm mindful of time, um, Alan. I'm not sure if there are any questions um, that from the audience that, that we can uh, address to, to Alex or Michael and myself, but I, I've certainly re been really enjoying the conversation and the insights from Alex and Michael, but I want to make sure we, we leave some time to answer those questions. Yeah, guys, this this has been fascinating throughout. Um, um, delighted for your thought leadership on this. Um, question came in. Just just first, are you guys available for any follow up questions? People have been pinging me in the chat, you know, and they just want to be mindful of the time. There's two questions asked already. We can jump into uh, Dante. Dante, um, he really wants to know like the person, the profile behind the AI. Um, who's the person who's going to create this? You know, I'm thinking the experts would be like data scientists, but is there anybody else kind of in the mix and how they should be thinking about it is one of his questions. Yeah, that, that, that's, um, that's a good question. Um, uh, I, I mean, yeah, fundamentally, uh, the training of the algorithms and optimizing the algorithms is, is, is a data science function. But, you know, uh, I, I often kind of make the point um, in, in, in various forums that, um, you know, I, I think viewing AI as part of a product means that to do AI well, you know, means that you, know, you need you need domain experts. So, you know, if, if you're building legal focused AI, you need lawyers to build it with you to verify that the, the data set um, is fulfilling the function that, that, that it's supposed to fulfill. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, and I mean, I think if, 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 you, if you 
if you don't get that and you just allow engineers to build to build a model or build build a system, it might work for engineers, but it, it won't work for um in this case for legal departments. No, I would I would echo that. I think uh, I think every legal department has one or or two. Uh, you 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 know if you start talking about AI, there's always someone who who jumps on it, and those are the people you need to find um, and and help you uh, with with the modeling and things like that. It, it can really not be done in in isolation. Then I don't think it will ever bring anything useful. Uh, and certainly, I know Michael and members of his team have been active in lecturing and various law schools on practical usage of AI and, and machine learning concepts. So I think it's really encouraging to see some law schools starting to incorporate it into the curriculum. And I think we will start to see a new wave of legal professionals with a broader skill set and, and, and different career paths open to them, which, which I think is really exciting. Yeah, that. That, this is brilliant stuff. Uh, another question from uh, Ryan Kennedy is information governance use of machine learning for retention policies is becoming a legal department involvement. Can you speak to how you see IG adopting AI or machine learning and how legal ops can be involved? Tough question. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not sure if you've a, 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 a perspective on on that. Um, all, off off the top of my head. So sorry. The the, the 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 question, Colin, was the use of AI for for information governance. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I you know Ryan's backgrounds in um, e discovery. Um, so mm -hmm. maybe we can follow up with Ryan on that one. Um. What what is what is your thoughts? Let me let me jump to the question. Garbage in, garbage out. You hear that the whole time, like you know. How do you put a gate for that? I know you came. You, you said something about a gold standard. Like, how do you like do a QA on a gold standard? Like, you know, what is the gold standard? Is there anything industry that, or is this, or, or are we kind of thinking this up as we're going along? Yeah, I, I mean, usually, um, usually when you're 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 scoring, um, let's say it's a, it's an invoice with with, with a model. Um, you know, the, the model will give a prediction with certain levels of confidence or there are, you know, techniques you can, you can use to analyze the prediction of the model to see, okay, is, is, this, is this based on a noisy signal or not a noisy signal? If it's based on a very noisy signal, so the transformations of the, of the model seem to be very noisy and not very well patterned, you, that's a good indicator that you actually, you want to actually refer it for, um, for annotation or, or, or to check it for annotation. So, um, it's 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 kind of it's it's technical, I guess, in terms of how we implement the decision to annotate or and um, mm -hmm. but you know the 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 core principle, I guess, is, is still yeah. I mean, if you if you don't have good data underpinning the model, then the the model isn't going to make good predictions. And um, but what you want to do is you want to refresh, retrain the model. And um, you know, because obviously you know data annotation is a scarce resource. And you want to make sure that where you're applying data annotation uh, to, 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 to add a particular data point to, to a goal standard data set that um, you're using that resource as efficiently as you can. So you, 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 don't, want, you, know, you don't want a case that's very straightforward uh, to be referred um, you know, to, to question, you know, should, I, should I annotate this or should I not annotate this? You want to you pick the edge cases where it looks like the, the model confidence is low or there's, there's a lot of noise in the um in, in the output from the model yep no uh, great great answer to a very tough question my, my only reference is in the contract ai space where we you were talking about unstructured uh, versus structured yeah I, I know i know some people that i that i deal with you know quite regularly do the structured but there's also people out there doing unstructured stuff where there's no humans in the loop you know which is you know now that we know from today's topic that structured is probably the way to go right it's like you, it is the gold standard for Nintendo. yeah well i mean it's 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 kind of application dependent really you know i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily say that uh, say an unsupervised technique you know in itself is, is inappropriate you know because sometimes you know particularly i think, I think you said it was an e-discovery use case you know it, it can be it can be really useful there you know if you don't have a view yet of what the content of the data is to apply an algorithm to cluster and, and group the data and allow you to, to start exploring it and, and making sense of it um, in bulk. So, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that, that one application is, is better than the other. It, it, it really depends on 
of the use case and 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 how you're you know how you're applying the algorithm I guess to to, to process and explore the data. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, is there any other questions from uh, the audience? Attendees? Looks like not, guys. We're giving we're we're oh we're over two minutes. <laughs> So I just want to thank you so much. This is so informative. Your thought leadership in this space, Bright Flag, Alex, Alexander, Michael, I really appreciate it. I uh, hope we can do something else again. I, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. I will follow up with everybody who attended today with a recording. Uh, if you have any questions, I left I left everybody's email in the chat. Uh, feel free to follow up with any questions. Uh, with that, I uh, hope to see you guys again, and thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate you showing up today. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Brilliant stuff, guys.